Good morning. Thank you for joining us today for our third and final session in our workshop series on advancing digital ag and conservation. My name is Sherry Rogie Fiddler and I am the president and CEO of Farm Foundation. And for those of you who might be joining us for the first time, I'd just like to take a few minutes to frame our discussion today. This workshop series comes at a time of uneven progress with digital ag and conservation. So we are so pleased that you've joined us today for our discussion and that we hope that we'll find ways to collaborate as a result of this series to continue to advance digital ag and conservation. And we'll be sharing some information about our upcoming research and collaboration ses session as we conclude today. So for those of you who may not know us, Farm Foundation is an accelerator of practical solutions for agriculture, and, and we accomplish this in a variety of ways, as you see here, including through collaboration. And this workshop series has been a great example of this type of collaboration. And we invite all of you to follow us on social media so that we can stay connected after the series. We want to thank our collaborators at Cornell University and the University of Illinois for their partnership and also recognize and thank our corporate sponsors, Corteva, AgriScience and Microsoft for their generous support of this workshop series. And we are eager to kick off today's session, but before we get started, I just want to review a few brief guidelines. And for those of you who've been with us uh, throughout the series, um, you'll be uh, old hands at this, but just as a few quick reminders, we especially encourage you to submit questions throughout today's session through the Q&A button. Just again, differentiate the chat button versus the Q&A button and submit your questions at any time uh, throughout the session. Um, we may have some technology issues with Zoom and just a reminder that often they will just stabilize over time. So just stay with us and, and they will usually take care of themselves. If you're posting on social media today, just a reminder that we ask you to use um, the hashtag digital ag workshop. Farm Foundation has had the wonderful opportunity to collaborate with Stephen Wolf from Cornell University and Kathy Bayless and Jonathan Coppice from the University of Illinois to bring you this series. And for this morning's workshop, we will hear some opening remarks from Jonathan Coppice, followed by our moderator, Stephen Wolf, and then our three speakers. And I'd like to extend a personal warm welcome to our three speakers today, Andrew Nelson, Christy Slay, and Chuck Spencer. After the three speakers, we will take time for questions and you can submit questions at any time throughout the presentation this morning, as well as the collaboration section on our workshop website. So with that, I will turn it over to Jonathan to talk about the University of Illinois centers here. Jonathan. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. I uh, appreciate this. I want to uh, extend again uh, our great appreciation to Stephen at Cornell and to the Farm Foundation uh, team, Morgan, Martha, Sherry, and everybody that helped put this together. Um, and then just a quick overview of a couple things with, at the University of Illinois, where we are uh, in the process of trying to uh, advance and stand up uh, more work around the uh, digital agricultural space, including the Center for Digital Ag, uh, stood up with the National Center for Supercomputing Applications here at University of Illinois, the College of ACES, Agricultural Consumer Environmental Sciences, as well as uh, the Granger College of Engineering. Uh, in the Department of Agriculture and Consumer Economics, we have also began, uh, begun a, a center for the, uh, uh, the economics of sustainability to really help focus around how we can uh, implement and apply economics to sustainable solutions for agriculture, for the food and environmental space. And then third, uh, we have continued to operate the Gardner Agricultural Policy Program. Uh, which looks at federal farm policies and has used uh, partnerships with the National Center for Supercomputing Applications to develop online web resources for farmers, including payment programs. So thank you for that. Uh, again, appreciate everybody attending and the time. And Stephen, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Jonathan. Steve Wolf, Cornell University, it's great to be with you. Thanks for joining us. And as Jonathan said, thanks to Farm Foundation and also to Kathy and Jonathan for their partnership. And thanks in advance to our three speakers today. I want to put in a quick word about the Cornell Initiative for Digital Agriculture, which stands kind of parallel to what Jonathan described at Illinois, where we have a premier computer science unit with a premier agricultural unit, joined by College of Veterinary Medicine, the College of Business, uh, and the College of Engineering to create uh, a vibrant intellectual community on campus and off campus running curriculum, 
hackathons, research, and lots of programming. I encourage you to visit the website and check us out. Next slide, please. So the topic for today is this integration of farm and off-farm resources to realize the potential of digital agriculture, specifically applied to the challenges of natural resource conservation. I think it is inaccurate and not particularly useful to imagine farmers as being the beginning and end of digital agriculture. I think that's a very simplified and unhelpful model. We already have, and in the future, we will have increasing participation by non-farm actors in farm management applied to data rich solutions for conservation and production. And so today's panel representing the input industry through Chuck Spencer from Growmark in Illinois, the farm sector, Andrew Nelson, a dryland farmer in the state of Washington, and downstream actors represented by Christy Slay and the Sustainability Consortium allows us to get this value chain into focus. Next slide, please. When we think about this kind of integrated systems model, whether it's a farming systems model or the farm as a nexus of contracts, we can take a variety of perspectives and we do so in the academy. So the value chain perspective would be familiar to many of you in this idea that we have an integrated system that supports consumer welfare is one way to look at this. Another way, and it's quite traditional in the discipline of agricultural economics is to think of farmers as a fully rational economic uh, actors and they're making decisions based on costs and returns and risk. A political economy perspective vested in sociology of agriculture would imagine farmers as squeezed between behemoths on the input side and the downstream side and questions of political economy uh, and the farm uh, and family farming have been a very important part of academic traditions and policy making. And the last one is to understand that the farmer and the farm and the land aren't necessarily integrated. And an ecological perspective would really privilege a focus on the land, on biogeochemical cycling, on water quality, and so forth. And so we try to keep those perspectives uh, in mind as we talk about today's session. Next slide, please. And in terms of the stakes, what is the division of labor? between on-farm and off-farm actors? How is it changing? And what are the implications of those changes and what are the policy stakes applied to environment? How can public policy and investment uh, advance productive development of digital agriculture and productive as seen through whose eyes, whose projects, whose vision could be advanced through public policy? And lastly, can the public sector, can Congress, can USDA, can the states shape development and should they shape development and if they do who are the actors whose voices should be active in that discussion about how public investment and public policy is mobilized and so with that allow me to introduce our first speaker we'll hear today from andrew nelson a dryland farmer in the state of washington a very interesting and highly capable farmer while there's no such thing as a representative farmer, I think we've managed to prove that with Andrew, who's a software engineer and a collaborator at Microsoft, will be our first speaker, followed by Christy Slay, uh, who's responsible for integration and technical uh, metrics applied to the initiative of the Sustainability Consortium, a tremendous collaborative initiative across a variety of sectors in which food and agriculture figures prominently. And finally, our last speaker will be Chuck Spencer, Executive, Executive Director of Corporate and Government Relations for Growmark, a grower cooperative in the state of Illinois and an important input provider to agriculture. So with that, Andrew, the floor is yours. Hi, Stephen. Thank you for the introduction. So I am a fifth generation farmer in the Palouse region of Eastern Washington. If we can go to the next slide, I'll go over the text. <laughs> um, I used to be a software engineer in Seattle. I ended up moving back to the farm about eight years ago. Um, since that time, we've grown our farm by about 50%, um, mostly organically. Um, we're, my main goal isn't to be the biggest farmer. Uh, my goal is to uh, increase my, my land's value per acre and help my farm become one of the leaders in uh, sustainability in terms of uh, financial sustainability 
ecological and ecological sustainability utilizing uh, newer technologies to make that work. Um, this picture that you see here is on my farm uh, about three days ago. So that is my drone doing mapping. Um, it's actually uh, right at the end of the mapping session that I did for uh, one of the slides that's coming up. So uh, I like to try to keep everything current on my slides. Uh, everything that you see is from my farm um, and all the data is proving out uh, all these different technologies on my farm. The technologies I use to um, save money, to be able to uh, get me some more uh, profit per acre or to help provide information to um, collaborative universities to, you know, hopefully up our game in the terms of uh, sustainability um, while still achieving the same or better profitability. If you can go to the next slide, please. So I just want to go over some quick points today uh, during my talk. I want to talk about uh, drone data collection, uh, panoramas for precision spraying, and also then you utilizing that information for drone precision spraying, uh, panoramas for monitoring build trials. So uh, panoramas are stitched images, they're maps that I'm doing with my drones, they're real time. Um, it's just, it's, you know, coming in real time, you need to make the decision that day. So that's why I prefer that method. Um, sensor placement, and uh, then finish up with talking about microclimates. And I kind of want to go on the side of this on how I use this information to help our farm, uh, you know, in multiple ways. Um, today, I'll be talking a little more on the sustainability side of how, you know, I'm using this to either make, uh, use less uh, inputs, um, which, you know, spraying less chemicals better in many ways. Um, I prefer not to put on as much, <laughs> as little chemical as possible. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it also saves money. It's uh, better for the environment. Um, it's just all around better. So if we can go to the next slide. I'll start talking about the drone data collection. So this is the same drone, just different angle. Uh, the field to the right and in the middle and to the left, I have peas, spring wheat, and fall wheat. Um, when do, mapping all these three fields, I end up with about uh, close to a terabyte worth of data, which is a lot of data. Um, uh, my problem is, is my internet connection cannot handle uploading all of that to the cloud to get it to stitch, um, be able to see the maps in a quick time frame. So when working with the FarmBeats team, uh, we've come up with an intelligent edge. Uh, it's something that when I do my flight, I can take the SD card out of my uh, drone, put it into my computer, and with one click, I can have all of my flights stitch. I can have them uh, show up on my home computer and then it'll slowly upload to the cloud without taking all of my bandwidth. So I can still be on video conferences. I can still you know, log into QuickBooks. I can still do everything that I need to do on my farm um, and not have it totally take up everything. So with that, uh, that intelligent edge, it really saves me a lot of time. It makes it so I can make quick and effective decisions, you know, that day. So I can do a mapping of a field to look for weeds and I can spray it the same day um, instead of having to wait for it to upload overnight or something like that. Um, it has really helped a lot to get it, um, to get my, my overall feedback loop condensed. Next slide, please. So this is one of the panoramas. Uh, this one's actually from last year. Uh, it is a precision spraying panor panorama. So I mapped out this field to see where we had Italian ryegrasses. Um, 
whenever you spray a uh, grassy herbicide, uh, in general, you usually um, will have some yield impact. Uh, usually it's negligible, but it depends on a lot of different factors, um, how uh, your temperatures are doing, um, did you freeze before or after, um, and a lot of variables that are outside of our control. So I prefer not to spray my whole field for grassy weeds, uh, especially if they're only on certain parts. Um, before I had the drone and being able to do these large scale maps of our fields in real time, I would have to spray the whole field because I'd find some grassy weeds, you know, scattered throughout the field. Um, there is no residual on the spray, but I have to spray the whole field, make sure that I get everything. So that way it doesn't impact yield. I'm not adding backlog weeds to the uh, seed bank. So this is a, a drone flight that I did. I was able to draw out where the, where the grassy weeds were. I had some ground truth data. I did walk some of the field when I was flying it. So that way, when I come back and look at it and I can help train a model based off of what I saw. Um, and if you go to the next slide, so last year I did that with the, my ground sprayer, I would plug in the GPS. This year I switched to having a drone sprayer as well. So I have uh, this drone sprayer, it sprays about a 40 foot swath. The great thing about this is it can do these precision sprays very easily. Um, most of our fields, um, in terms of grassy weeds this year for our fall wheat were, you know, a few acres. And that's what this drone is perfect for. It can do those spot sprays. Um, and I'm not making a huge mix that I'm having left over. Um, it is, it is quite precise that way. And it actually, uh, how the, the drone helicopter works and how it atomizes the, the spray it actually did a much better job on my grasses. Um, so I was, I was pretty happy with the decision to, to get it this year and to apply it. So that way I'm able to uh, keep going forward on, on spraying as little chemical as possible. Um, it's a lot easier to do with a much smaller sprayer than you know one of your really big ground sprayers. Next slide. So I was saying how I use panoramas for uh, spraying and I use them for a lot of other things. I use them a lot for tracking. So I'll, even if I don't currently have a field operation that I need to do, I will still do a drone flight on my field. So that way I can track throughout the year how the field changes and at the end of the year correlate it with yield maps and I have that additional data to be able to look back in time and see oh was there something that I could have noticed you know if there is an issue coming up or if it was a really really good crop you know maybe I can look and see if I can uh, get more information off of it so it's one of those things where you may not be using all of the data right now but it's very valuable to be able to go back in time and look at the data um, in, the, in your historical maps. So what I'm doing on a couple of my fields are different field-wide trials. So I'm doing big strips through my field. This field that is uh, mapped right here is about 70 acres. My uh, trial area is about 10 acres. Uh, a straight line through the low areas and the high areas so I can get a good mixture of soil types. Um, and it's a direct seed trial. So we try to be as minimum till as possible. Um, but with my green peas this year, I decided to do a trial where I am having my green peas are full direct seed. So I cut the straw short from the last year and I was able to go forward and, um, and just see directly into it with our drill. Um, so far, the emergence looks just as good as next to it. I'm excited to see what blooming time is like for my peas, see if it extends that out. Um, and in general, I just need the more information for my farm to make the good decision 
going forward of, hey, maybe for, you know, this type of crop, I should change my practices to, you know, have less tilling. And, but I need the information on trials like this to tell me for my fields, um, directly beside the older practice, this, the newer practice that I'm doing needs to be able to be as profitable or more profitable for me to be able to do that going forward. Um, with margins so thin, you can't change all of your fields over to a different practice and have, and have those margins go to zero. Um, that just doesn't work. So that's why I like to be able to uh, track all this information. That yellow strip is my, my trial throughout the field. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't show up quite as good on Zoom, but uh, if you do zoom in there, you can see individual um, green pea plants uh, going throughout the field. Next slide. So I wanted to touch on sensor placement. Since we are talking about sustainability throughout the farm, one thing that you need to know is every farm is different. Every field is different. Every part of the field is different. And so um, with Farm Beats, we have this really cool uh, AI where you're able to look at your field with prior satellite data, run a sensor placement on your field and uh, AI algorithm. And it'll tell you based off of your previous um, vegetation indexes throughout your field on a time period you select, this is where you should put your sensors. So that way, these spread out of sensors, I can get a pretty accurate picture of what the moist, soil moisture level is throughout my field. So that's actually where I have my sensors placed this year on this field, but I do have them scattered throughout all of my fields to be able to see if I have a good, um, see if the, there is much variability between fields um, and make sure to double check my practices going through the fields. Um, it's, it's something that has been quite valuable to me. And next slide. I just wanna to touch on that variability a little bit more. Last, this current year, I have one piece, uh, which is that star in the top uh, of my map. It usually has a little less rain this year. It has two and a half inches more rain than every other field. Um, and then even from my fields that are close by, I have variances of uh, within one to two inches, um, even within a mile. So that is how I have, you know, that's why you need to be able to look at these microclimates when making your decisions. Because if you run a full field trial in one area, but it has two inches more of rain, that's not going to help very much. Um, and then next slide. I think that should be it. Yep. And uh, I'll quickly touch on the two open questions. Um, do I lose image quality when from my intelligent edge? I do not, and that's why it's great. So it does a full stitch on my computer. Um, on the cloud, it's a little lower resolution until everything gets uploaded there. Um, how would 5G tech help digital ag? It would help me a lot. I use TV white spaces and uh, Microsoft IoT's TV white space to connect everything right now. And that is uh, very helpful. I would love 5G. Uh, the issue is range. Um, we don't even have good 4G here. I can't even walk out of my house and have good 4G. So uh, 5G would be great, but there would need to be so many more towers, I'll never get them, unfortunately. <laughs> um, and then what information do I get from my field sensors? I get soil moisture, CO2, rainfall. Uh, my soil moisture probe goes all the way down to five feet. Um, I get uh, light intensity, uh, the, the standard wind, humidity, um, pressure, uh, but really the system is flexible to literally any, I can plug in any sort of information that I want into it. Um, so at least in the Palouse region, our, our weather conditions fluctuate within a quarter mile. <laughs> so it makes it a little more difficult. 
Um, with our satellite data, I am starting to combine information down to uh, what we have uh, on the farm. Um, and that's actually what the soil moisture runs off of. But uh, I think my time is up for now. I will type answers to the rest of the people so that way uh, no one feels like they're left out. <laughs> Andrew, thank you. thank you very much. Well done. And it's always interesting to see what you're up to and the fact that um, you do keep updating your slides. So those of us who have seen you uh, share your experience with digital agriculture are always learning something new. Um, <laughs> And I'm really glad that you didn't touch the third question that came up on the Q&A because I want to really get at that later when we have the other panelists, this question of how does the average person, someone who's not a software engineer, realize and harness data the way that you're doing? And that's why I think off-farm actors, the traditional commercial agronomists and the CCAs and the independent crop consultants, but also NRCS, Cooperative Extension, and increasingly downstream actors who have a stake in the quality of uh, agricultural production and the um, environmental credentials of uh, that production. And so with that, let me introduce Christy Slay, who's gonna talk about that, representing the Sustainability Consortium. Christy, thank you for being here. Thank you, Stephen. Good morning, everyone. Next slide. So I'm with the Sustainability Consortium, and uh, we are an academic-based nonprofit. I'm based at the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville. Our sister university is Arizona State University in the School of Sustainability in uh, Scottsdale. And then we also have offices at Bogenhagen University in a close partnership there, uh, representing our European uh, interests. And so the purpose of our organization, kind of a unique entity, we're, we're a multi-stakeholder organization, and our goal is to have all consumer products sustainable, which is a little bit of a heavy lift, but we do that by bringing science and tools um, into the value chain. Next slide. And so we focus deep in the value chain. Uh, we've, we've reviewed uh, thousands of peer-reviewed uh, scientific papers to identify what are those key issues across across consumer goods products, um, and in this case, food, uh, and help everyone in the supply chain, brands and retailers, address consumer concerns that they're hearing about in the news uh, through NGOs about some of the issues related to supply chains. Next slide. So we do this, we have a number of members. Um, we have, have leading NGOs, we have universities, and as well as, uh, as, well as small and large companies. Uh, including brands and retailers. And uh, together we work to uh, understand the science, uh, bring the, the science into business and, and, and create business questions uh, that, are, that are clear, understandable, and highlight uh, the metrics that have been created uh, in a number of other platforms and leverage those uh, in our system so that we're not reinventing the wheel, we're not asking for metrics at the retail level um, that are, are different from what's being being asked in supply chains. And so happy to say next that the that Cornell is uh, our newest member, uh, university partners. So we, we thank you all for thanks Stephen for having me. Next slide. And so I mentioned we cover all consumer goods, which is a lot. Uh, we cover pretty much anything you can purchase online or in a retail store. Um, almost 50% of that is food. And so we have done a lot of research, especially with our partners at Wagenhagen, um, who are agricultural experts, and also at the University of Arkansas, in understanding what some of those key issues are um, embedded in food supply chains. Next slide. And so the platform that we have that retailers use uh, to, to year over year measure and benchmark a brand performance, supplier performance, is called Thesis. And so you'll hear me reference this. This is kind of a, a, a nod to our academic roots here, but Thesis is our online platform uh, for measurement and reporting uh, consumer product sustainability. Next slide. So through Thesis, we have a number of, of retail users. So Walmart and Sam's Club are our largest users. They've been um, uh, surveying their suppliers, assessing their suppliers' performance uh, for five years now. Uh, with our with our thesis tools. And so we also have um, other retailers as well. Walmart's our largest user, but we have Kroger, Walgreens, uh, Sprouts, as well as Amazon, Marks and Spencer, and other European retailers who are leveraging this consistent platform for measurement. You can think of us as, as the pull. And so 
Um, so all the activities that are happening in the supply chain, consumers are, are wanting to know about those. We want to be able to communicate the science and communicate uh, scientifically valid metrics. And so leveraging all those existing tools, as I mentioned out there, um, there are many, we have a number of partners. Um, how do we then you know, essentially pull data through the supply chain to be able to communicate ultimately to retailers and consumers about the sustainability of their products? Next slide. And so digging into food a little bit. So, um, so we've collected a lot of data over the years. So we have um, not more than 15 questions that are asked for each product category. So you could have um, green peas, for example, as, as a product category. So there's 15 questions, a number of those are, are farm focused questions. Uh, and, and what we're finding is that with our farm focused questions, um, typically 50% of, of respondents don't have data to report. So there's a disconnect between all this incredible data that may be being collected on the farm to manage the farm and actually communicating about production and sustainability through the supply chain. And so of course, agricultural supply chains are complicated and so that those data systems are in place. Um, and so we've really dug into this. So why do we have this sort of, I don't know, we call it the I don't know barrier. Why do we have this at the retail level, the brand and retail level, this communication just isn't happening about what's, what's going on on the farm. So next slide. And so today I want to talk about three barriers that we've found um, in our research and in our work and collaboration uh, with all of our partners. And the first is lack of traceability. And so for many leading companies, brand companies, um, they don't even know where, where their commodities are coming from. So commodity supply chains are complex. And so there's just a big barrier there to even knowing where the farm is. Um, Secondly, is we've, we've just published some research and I'll go into a little bit more detail here, but farmers uh, don't trust, don't trust sharing their data and they, they want financial incentive to share that data um, for a variety of very good reasons. And so I'll, I'll um, go into that in a little bit. And then connectivity issues and connectivity issues ranging from not having broadband on broadband issues and connectivity issues on the farm all the way to just connecting software and having software talk to each other. Um, and then, then this also incredible use of paper records and, and lack of digitization on the farm. So we'll dig into each of these. Next slide. So lack of traceability, next. So within our own data, I wanted to dig into this and just say, well, 50% off the top can't answer farm level questions. Of those that are answering farm level questions, this is, this is one of the questions that is um, or key performance indicators that is consistent across almost all of our, it's included in all, almost all of our food categories. It just says, can you, can you map your supply? Do you know where your crop supply comes from? Can you map it to the country, the region, or the farm? And those are three independent answers. And what we found is 10% of companies were off the bat said, I don't know, I don't have that information. 35% say, I actually, I have some data, but I, I, it's not that data. I can't trace it um, to, the, to the country, the farm. Um, or the region. And then some can trace to, of those that can respond, um, some can trace to the country, some can trace to the region, some can trace to both. Only 8% of our 800, almost 800 suppliers that are reporting in our system can say, I can trace the origin to the farm. And so, and of those, those are usually produ produce um, categories, so they're fruits and vegetables, and those that can respond are actually improving their scores and saying, I'm gaining more traceability and more transparency um, over time. Next slide. So to address this, we've, um, me and my team have created a tool, a very entry level tool to help companies understand where they may be sourcing from with very limited information. So we've talked to a number of procurement officers within brands um, and, and the, the issue there are many, um, just gaining transparency um, all the way to the farm is expensive, it's a challenge. Of course, regions, sourcing regions change based on quality, based on price, based on availability. And so just getting a handle on where, where, where the origins of supply chains, um, agricultural origins are, is really a challenge. And so we've created a tool to a kind of a jumping off point for, for companies to be able to understand with limited information um, where their supply might be coming from and definitely where it's not coming from. So we use that by using agricultural production data and using import and export data 
about where, uh, how commodities are traded around the world. And we can kind of back into um, where those production regions are if you really don't have um, a good starting point. And so then we can start to overlay risks and what types of risks might be exposed, um, a company might be exposed to in those, in those areas and, and just start the conversation around um, transparency and, and traceability in, in farm supply chains. Next slide. Um, so I mentioned the study that we've, we've recently conducted, um, farmer perspectives on data. And so our partner was uh, Trust in Food. And, um, and so we we're really excited to, to, to partner with them because they have incredible, um, incredible reach into the farm community. Um, they are a really trusted partner um, through Farm Journal Media. And they, with them, we've surveyed, we got responses from almost 400 uh, farmers and uh, in 44 states. And what they told us was really interesting, some of which we already knew, but some of which were surprising to us. Next slide. So in terms of trust and data sharing, uh, what we found is 50% of our respondents said they don't think it's a right for a consumer to know what's, what's happening on their farm um, or how they manage their farm. And so this, this, um, this was kind of surprising to us. Um, not surprising was this unequal profit di distribution is that farmers really do feel like there is profit to be made in their data and they're right um, and and they don't see that return they don't see that coming back to them and so so sharing is kind of a non-starter if that's the case um, have said that they don't trust the government or private companies with their information what was interesting to us is their trusted advisors, the crop advisors, the people that are coming on their farm that they listen to, 71% said those folks are not encouraging them to collect more data or to digitize. And so I think this was a big surprise to us um, because that's really where we think of as that interaction happening and that, that, um, that, that those technology um, conversations happening, those changes in practices happening, um, and that all requires data. Next slide. And so another barrier um, in, in communicating, collecting data was lack of access to capital. Um, and, and Andrew has this incredible, incredible story to tell with all this incredible um, sensors and technology. Um, but for, for many, uh, you know, that, that is a barrier, I think, for just being able to afford some of that equipment and, and the knowledge um, and how to use it. Um, there has to be clear benefit to collecting data and most of our uh, respondents said that they don't see that clear benefit, uh, whether that's to managing the farm or financial benefit. Um, and then what we did find is that if there is incentive, if there is financial incentive, those trust issues can be relaxed a little bit. Sharing data um, is possible, um, but, there, but there is a price for that. And then what we found, which is not surprising me at all, is that most farmers, regardless of whether they're collecting data or sharing data, they're doing conservation practices on the land. At least one conservation practice, many were doing multiple conservation practices. And so that information is so important for the value chain to know. And being able to communicate that in a safe space, getting, getting value, the true value that, is, is, that they have earned um, from these conservation practices um, is, is so important. And so I think there's this kind of disconnect between being able to communicate about what you're doing on your farm and all these, all the conservation practices and the ability to do so or the trust. Um, next slide. Okay, connectivity issues on the farm. Focus on the farm versus not just the farm. This is just our, our study, but we're really just trying to unpack again, like what is the, what is the issue here in being able to, to um, know what's going on in agricultural value chains at the brands and the retail level. Um, so there's very low software usage and actually it was lower than we suspected. Um, of our respondents, 62% said they, they didn't use any farm level um, software in 2019 and 46% said they store primarily paper records. And so again, this is the ability to, 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 to share what's happening on the farm. Um, this is, this is a, a big barrier, at least in our study. Um, of those few that did use digital um, solutions, 70% said they weren't satisfied with them. So again, this, this is a, a flag for, for us. You know, if we are going to digitize, um, it's got to bring value and it's got to, to have a higher satisfaction rate. And so we need to dig into that a little 
that what's going on here is it connectivity is it technical assistance is it tra training on the software or is it the software itself um, and then this this lack of access really does it's the broadband issue 63 percent said i don't have a stable connection just to andrew's point um you know he doesn't have he's barely got 4g definitely doesn't have 5g i would say a lot of farmers don't even have that and so um, if we have connectivity issues and these softwares are dependent on connectivity then then we've got a big issue here next slide connectivity issues along the ag value chain next slide so we completed a study last year really looking at the, the the landscape of digital agriculture so we wanted to say well who is collecting data that could be um, used for sustainability purposes all along the value chain so sustainability consortiums at the far far right here on the retail side and then we've got a lot in between that's really collecting data what through through precision ag technology farm management software this is a year old so i'm sure it's already out of date the space changes a lot and so um, farm sustainability metrics there's a number of organizations working on on farm sustainability metrics and tools to translate uh, the data that farmers collect every day uh, into sustainability metrics so this is just sort of a, an overview of the landscape and how complicated it is next slide so we wanted to look at who's actually connected to who <laughs> and who are the the key uh, the key players in case and john deere it's not surprising there's so many connections to those um those but then when you we sort of try to trace this out it gets very complicated very quickly and so for a grower to try to navigate this and know which software do i choose how is it connected am i going to be able to report sustainability information um, that is not a, a clear path and so teasing this apart continuing to dig into this so that there's clear guidance is important next slide and just to wrap up you know we've done our part uh, in the thesis platform to try to connect our system to these farm level um, farm level sustainability indicators and so um, we've created an api so that any of these farm level calculators that are are, are measuring sustainability and capturing sustainability metrics um, can be reported directly through into our thesis platform so we're doing our part to try to try to ease this burden on growers and in the supply chain um, but there's still a lot of work to do next slide so i'll pause there um, thank you all and and uh, look forward to the discussion thank you christy and I think that it's quite interesting. And I think these three barriers, this lack of traceability, lack of trust, and lack of connectivity is an interesting frame, um, particularly as it relates to data-rich futures. So with that, uh, let me turn to Chuck Spencer, our third and final panelist. Chuck has an interesting career representing Growmark and government relations, but previously with American Farm Bureau Federation and direct experience with legislation related to agriculture. So thanks for being here, Chuck. Thank you, Stephen, and congratulations to the panelists on a wonderful presentation. Next slide. I think that what we will find is that there is a theme between the panelists today. And as Stephen had pointed out, I've had the opportunity to continue to be engaged with not only uh, farmers and certified crop advisors and the ag retail market, but also involved with farm policy, conservation policy, sustainability policy discussions at, at state, uh, national levels, provincial, in, in Canada as well. And what we have heard today from Andrew and Christy is certainly reflected in what our experience is as well. And I, I just want to take the opportunity, and of course as panelists we can all share with our comments back and forth, but take the opportunity to find this string of commonality between us. And one is, is, is uh, trust in data. Uh, you know, I'd certainly farmer controlled needs to be owned by the farmer. And I think we all understand that. And there is a need for a constant focus of return on investment. There's been comments made about complexity of systems, the diversity of systems, the coloration of systems, which in, when I mentioned coloration of systems, in, in uh, production agriculture, your farm equipment tends to be of a specific color. And so the companies have, are, you know, primary companies are either red or green or yellow or gray, depending on your region. And there's certainly other colors like blue. So you probably have a full palette and spectrum of colors. The important part of that is to be colorblind in our technology to where we can collect data from those systems, make it simple, 
and easy for the user, inexpensive, and focus on return investment for the producer at the field and farm level. In my slide here, what you'll note is I've got some uh, expectations that we have continued to find in talking to farmers and what they would like to see. And certainly farmer control, uh, independent business people across this country uh, certainly want their ability to control their data. I can remember and think of an example where uh, a friend of ours had bought a new tractor, was going through the field and in the older tractors, you used to leave, leave your foot on the clutch because there was a heavy spring that always pulled it back. Everything is electronically switched now. He received a call on his cell phone from the manufacturer dealer and asked him, John, is your foot on the clutch of your tractor? And he goes, well, yeah, yeah, it is. And he goes, you've got to take it off because your micro switch is your clutch temperature is out of parameter. He goes, you're going to burn it up if you don't take your clutch foot off the clutch. And he was shocked by the level of oversight, the amaz <laughs> amazement on the other hand that he saved a very expensive repair. But then it also got to thinking about where his data is going, who is, uh, has access to it, and what are they using it for? So the flexibility of answering and, and dealing with some of those questions and developing the trusted relationships. I think Christy pointed out that the role of the certified crop advisor is extremely important. We've seen that not only in surveys produced within agriculture, but also by non-governmental organizations as well, when they are interested in increasing conservation or sustainability practices on the farm, who is a trusted advisor? The person that a farmer develops their crop plan with is very trusted because that is very propriety-based data and they're very interested in making sure they have a trust factor. So you start thinking about it, I would say that a picture like we have here in the background on the screen is very representative of how many people actually know any one producer's uh, plan on their farm. If they family farm, obviously they have a uh, governance board there within their family or uh, other type of arrangement, but for the most part, they're sole proprietors in which they're talking with very few people, but making what I think are very good decisions. You also heard the ethic that Andrew employs on his farm from the standpoint of conservation. And if we were to have talked about wildlife, water quality, those ethics are embedded. What we're not good at is actually pulling that data off the farm and sharing it with entities, as Christy has pointed out, within the consortium of retailers, food producers, and consumers. After all this time, I noticed that we still struggle with developing the story of agriculture where it is accepted on a broad scale. And I think that we're making great advancements. That's the one thing I want us to walk away with. Having conversations like this advances this, uh, these objectives. I think that uh, we continue to recognize this at the farm level and with farmers and in our ag retail space. I mean, I not only uh, work for a particular cooperative that has a broad footprint in the United States as well as uh, in Canada, but I know that colleagues who work in the ag retail space, we all discuss sustainability, water quality, um, impacts for on, the, on the land, in watersheds, and then what return on investment can be focused on by the producer. And, and that's something that's gonna be important for us to know. The must improve the return on investment. We heard that theme, we've got to find profit, otherwise the business of farming is not sustainable. So to be sustainable, you have to have the ability for returns on investment. Uh, certainly farmers are starting to understand the income potential from carbon capture markets. So when we have the policy discussions of climate change, I don't hear frequently enough about how carbon capture is going to translate into the practices on the land for a reward program for producers. And I can assure you right now that the mindset of producers is one in which they are expecting to receive some type of a reward for practices that would produce carbon credits or carbon sequestration programs. I think everyone recognizes at the farmer level, and they're engaged in the debate now, about what climate change practices could occur. 
what carbon capture programs could be implemented by government or governments and what that means to their production practices. And I think there's a, an important component here that was certainly highlighted in Andrew's presentation today and data points and data collection. You'll note that his discussion about his fields in today's example, and this can be applied across any of our local, local uh, agricultural fields in, in this country, is there's great variability in rainfall patterns, microclimate, soil types, and the management techniques that are needed for the type of crop and those conditions that a producer faces. One of the greatest challenges of sustainability programs is, is trying to come up with metrics that measure on a very broad-based platform when we're dealing with very site-specific instances of production. And I think that's one of the things that you've heard emphasized is flexibility in programming. It's going to be critical. How we establish goals, what those goals can be, and how they are achieved by the producer on the land, and then what the end expectation is from uh, either the government, policy officials, or the consumer. We've got to be, we, everybody wants to be close to the farm, few people want to go out and weed their garden. And we've got to be able uh, to understand the practices that actually have to take place on the land. Uh, I would also like to say that uh, practice change, if we talk about production systems, I've heard a lot about uh, why don't everyone go no-till, Chuck? Why, do, why doesn't the ag retailer and their crop advisors simply walk out to the farm and tell the farmer what to do? And of course, that is not a structure that would work in any facet. And I think Christie's um, survey would show very clearly what producers want, and that is they've got to be in control, have flexibility in their program, and, and be the decider uh, of what their production practice is going to be. And let me give you a quick example. When we talk of the difference between no-till and conservation tillage platforms, and conservation tillage platforms, you have a minimum uh, soil residue, let's say, of 30%. And that's common throughout the Midwest and different areas, of course, your soil types can change. Obviously, you, you would want to be in a higher residue situation based on slope soil type and, and local conditions. But for this example, uh, let's just go with 30% residue cover. Uh, if you were to go to a no-till or strip-till practice, you would likely have to have a planter change. It is very easy in today's environment to have a uh, $250,000, a quarter of a million dollars in a planter, and then the tractor that must pull that has to have an upgraded hydraulic system and likely over 200 horsepower to pull that type of planter through uh, the fields that we have. And you'll note that our percentage of plant when we get behind in a planting season can, can fluctuate upwards very quickly it's because we're now planting instead of four to five mile an hour, we are planting now at nine and 10 mile an hour with the accuracy of in the 90 percentile of plants being placed an inch and a half apart. So when you think about the speed the, and, and the technology that are incorporated in today's equipment, practice change on, on the field is typically expensive. And that's why we have such farmer engagement and focus on return on investment in these types of discussions. Next slide. So I will make a summary here about the ag retail perspective, and then Stephen and uh, will certainly guide us in a, a dialogue here for the rest of the time. Uh, a lot of what we've talked about here in, in our perspective is ag retailers are our partners uh, that we have that we are with the farmer. It's uh, like we're the pair of gloves. We've got to fit the hand of that farmer in what he or she wants to do in their production practices and guide them. Yes, we have a role. We have a role in the ethic of application. We have a role in the discussion of conservation. We certainly have a role in technology platforms, as been pointed out. We uh, are increasing our um, work with pilot programs, and we are going to then be scaling uh, across our platform on digitization of our customer base with their approval, with their understanding and our understanding that the farmer owns the data. 
So it is confidential to them, it is owned by them, but we can show them how digitizing their farm operations uh, will gain them an advantage. And then in the future, I will foresee, and it's going to be the very near term, where we will be able to help producers in given regions through de-identified aggregated data comparisons, what they are doing compared to their peers. And that I think will be very helpful in both Christie's work on sustainability platforms with companies. I think it will be very helpful for the public policy discussions. I think it would be very helpful for a farmer uh, like Andrew, who is really, as we can all tell, already doing many of the things that I've been discussing. So that's going to be important. You'll note that I did put in there in summary that practices must be flexible to the grower farm and then the field. And we as a team must be focused on increased conservation compliance and, and our knowledge base. I think that's something that's overlooked and clearly showed up in Christie's survey is that the discussion between the farmer and their crop advisor must take place not only for the nutrients and the balance that it takes place for the soil type, the climate, the, the slope, et cetera, in the field, but then also conservation goals. The farmer and landowners have the ethic that they understand soil is their uh, production platform and to keep, retain and keep it as, as much of it in the field as possible is what the critical component is. I'm also going to share, as we have all experienced, weather events. And the weather events that we've had, when we have rainfalls of two and a half inches in one hour, and they may come in late February or even recently within regions of this country. We can all have the best of conservation practice implementation and ethic intent and, and the natural uh, e events will, will change what has happened on our field in a dramatic fashion. But we've got to make that leap and, and certainly match up with them. We've got to have cooperation between government and private sector and the premise that it must be voluntary and incentive-based is going to be the quickest way for practice change across the country. It is time-tested. Yes, it is somewhat traditional for those of you engaged in the policy discussion and debate, but it is going to be the quickest way and we have seen that over and over. And then private sector programs, as we talked about, must allow innovation and flexibility. We, I, I have seen at times where we try to develop a program that is very broad-based and there's always trade-offs in every model. Uh, I'm not a, a modeling expert, but I do uh, happen to know a few. And there are trade-offs when we model, and that's one of the challenges. And, and it also is, is something that we've got to work through, but uh, I think all of us should be certainly aware that we've got to allow, to allow innovation to occur. We also need to have the flexibility in the programs and what our objectives are. So with that, I think I've consumed my time amount and look forward to the discussion with Stephen, panelists, and the participants today. Thank you, Chuck. I appreciate it. And it's great to hear uh, your perspective on this. And I think it is a very important perspective given your experience and the role you play in uh, agricultural production. So we have a variety of interesting questions and I appreciate them. I encourage all participants to share additional questions it's likely we won't cover all of them, but that's by design. And we really want to use this audience and your perspectives, your experience uh, to enrich the conversation that will uh, flow on after our 90 minutes are exceeded today. We have a digest or an archive of the comments uh, submitted during our, our webinar today. And you're also encouraged to post information to the forum section. And Martha King had shared that link with you through the chat. Um, my first question goes back to this uh, comment about how does the average farmer realize power in data? And I'm interested in Chuck's perspective about what the dealerships are doing and what types of investments and what types of public policy could enhance their ability to add value. I'm interested in Christie's idea. She described the sustainability consortium as a kind of pull factor, but I'm also interested in a more hands-on and active role and what ideas they have about uh, whether it's contract farming or consulting or private standards and playing an active role 
in uh, shaping farm management. And of course, I'm interested in Andrew's perspective. Um, my guess is that he is not able to uh, use crop consultants and commercial agronomists to add much value because of his expertise is so far off the charts. But what does he see in terms of the local infrastructure and other farmers in his region and what's happening in terms of uh, our dealers? Is his actions raising the bar? Is he introducing competition to the ag chemical dealers to up their game, to meet him on his level? What's happening? Well, I work with a lot of mine. Um, I still have lots to learn from them. <laughs> That's for sure. I'm, I'm uh, insanely lucky. One of my uh, close friends from, I went from preschool all the way and graduated high school with, uh, is now my neighbor, lives about a mile away and is, uh, a crop consultant for nutrient. So he drives by about half of my fields on the way to work. And uh, that is very valuable to have a crop consultant who looks at your fields every day <laughs> while sipping their coffee. So, um, so I do get a lot of information from him, but I do also work with, uh, you know, a lot of our, our chemical companies, especially in the area, um, covering what I'm doing and what they're doing, trying out their new systems. Um, and uh, saying, you know, there's always some parts of it that are like, oh yes, this works great. And then other parts where I'm, I have to call them and be like, I, I'm a computer science person and I have no idea how to use <laughs> your new system. So um, I think there's kind of a wide range there, but, uh, but I do think that there is a good push for uh, better collaboration with farmers. Um, you know, a lot will sit down with the farmer and go through um, their new tools um, and even all the way through to um, insurance. Um, this year I submitted all of my insurance online, which for me was amazing. I didn't have to go in, I could see it on the map, I could click through it, I could take my time, I could go through my records and, and double check and, uh, and that has been very, very helpful. Thanks, Andrew. Chuck or Christy? Yes, I would. Uh, I think that uh, what we are going to see is what uh, is reflective of what Andrew said as well, which I think that I like the example he had, which I find to be repeated across uh, agriculture, is that we tend to have long-term relationships with people that we've known for quite some time. And that is very helpful when it comes to how we develop the relationships, the trust factors that we're involved in, how we're going to bridge into this digital um, platform of the future. I think it's important for all of us to note that this is why you hear from agriculture and policy discussions about the continued need for broadband. I, I advise policymakers quite a bit of, from the standpoint of you think that the self-driving uh, car is fascinating. Farmers something similar uh, in self-guidance systems for their harvesting and planting equipment for over 10 years. And that's just the guidance systems. What we need to advance is the technology and connectivity. And Andrew's able to do it as well as other systems where you can patch it through once you collect the data during the day. But I think if we're to take the next leap, it'd be very good to have the connectivity. I think that um, the focus has to be on simplicity too. Some of the things that we talk about when it comes to sustainability programs and platforms, I can uh, tell you that it's difficult to sit down with a producer and have them answer 55 questions. I've heard of people discuss about 120 questions, 150 questions, and then they realize that what we've got to get down to is something more simple. And when I say simple, we have to be able to do it in a time frame that's reasonable. We have to be asking relevant questions and then keep those principles in mind. Are they return on investment based? Are they, do they allow innovation? And are they flex, do they allow flexibility for each of the producers? Yeah, I have a big vote on the flexibility for producers, by the way. Um, even throughout the same field, we need flexibility. Right. Christy, can you say anything about uh, your role in supporting farm level, field level, and subfield level applications of data, apart from trying to um, communicate the importance and reward 
uh, by uh, ensuring sustainable access to markets and value-added products or identity-preserved products? Absolutely. So, um, yeah, the Sustainability Consortium will never be a kind of a farm-facing organization, but we definitely work through our partners um, who are. And so, you know, the, the role that we have is, I think, unique in that we sit across many different organizations and see where there's overlap, see where there's redundancy, see where there's um, opportunity, and try to bring that together um, and bring those groups together who are working um, that are, are farm are farm facing to try to highlight some of those gaps, some of those opportunities to harmonize um, so that, you know, to Chuck's point, there's there's not a list of 150 questions at the end of the day. You know, how do we how do we distill this down so that sustainability isn't a burden, that it isn't hard, that it is it is leveraging the information that's already being collected to manage the farm um, on a daily basis. And so that information is there. Um, oftentimes it's just not um, the sustainability language is the barrier. And so how do we translate, do some translation between what consumers and retailers and brands and how we're talking about farming and how farmers talk about farming and sustainability. And it's not, it's not sustainability. They don't use that language. And so how do we translate that? Um, and how do we make sure that, that we're not trying to to enforce a value system, you know, down this, you know, up the supply chain uh, to the grower that we're taking their value system and translating it into, into our, our vernacular, our language. Thank you. Um, I want to uh, introduce, uh, and we're getting lots of big picture, interesting and, and important questions, and I, I encourage you to keep them coming. Um, Keith Koval raises this question about data standards. He didn't use that language or interoperability. But the idea that the friction associated with different data technologies, different data platforms, different data standards, mm -hmm. and the uh, uh, opportunity for public policy or private cooperative consortia, um, what's happening and what could happen, particularly interested in public policy, how could we uh, lower the bar for having systems talk to one another and make it easier to layer and integrate data sets, both from a technical point of view in terms of standards, but if you want to address this question of incentives and trust, I'm happy to have that discussion as well. So I, I think standards would be nice, but we need to make sure they aren't going to constrain innovation um, as somebody's going forward. A uh, great example is my uh, reporting that I have to do for FSA on, on planted acres uh, and, and then, uh, you know, the the questionnaires that I get on it. Um, they know all the fields I have. They have satellite images of them. From those satellite images, you can, within a, it's a high degree of certainty, know what's planted in that field. Uh, why are we bothering farmers with stuff like that? Um, instead of, you know, the, the better questions or uh, better policies of having us um, spend our time on, you know, on questions that you can't glean from information like that. So I think it's a bigger thing than just the, uh, you know, I can just give my data to them in a standardized format. It's, you know, some of those things, they have the data yet they still ask for it um, and you still have to give it. And it drives me nuts every time because I'm like, I know you have this information. <laughs> <laughs> And it's probably more accurate than what I'm going to type in. And I can guarantee it's going to be more accurate than what somebody's handwriting in, um, in terms of acres of stuff. So that's, that's kind of my two cents is, uh, first we need to start using the data that, that they have. Thank you, Andrew. Chuck, Christy, Chuck, please, you go right ahead, then we'll turn to Christy. Yes, I, I will give it a shot here because we do have, um, an agricultural platform discussion between uh, manufacturers as well as ag retail and a number of different industries where we do uh, dis talk through how we can share specific and common data points of either um, data collection, billing, but they're very basic and very um, much oriented toward uh, 
a very general common platform and, and not going into sustainability. So at least there's a framework out there between manufacturers of, of agriculture equipment, uh, ag retail space, and others within the framework of agriculture supply chain, where they are talking about how they achieve interconnectivity between the different types of data collection systems. But it is not addressing itself into the sustainability world at this point in time, but could be used as at least a thought provoker. I want to add this thought, though, about, um, and then maybe get some of the panelists' reactions too. Uh, when it comes to sustainability platforms, brands, it, it may be easy to discuss here what some of the commonalities could be for, to allow flexibility and innovation. And you would find, I think we would agree on very basic premise of what the platform should look like. But then what starts happening is, is that a brand gets involved. And then they say, well, we would like to know this component of the production system so then we can advertise uh, the, about it on our product. And so then what happens is, is you start having the variability between platforms where they, kind of, they decrease their communication between one another. And then simplicity uh, decreases at the farmer level, which then increases complexity. And I was going to throw that out there. And then Christy, of course, has the ability to see a lot of that. And maybe she could comment uh, whatever way you choose on my statement. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you, Chuck. I see it. I see it every day. Um, you know, different, different retailers, different brands making different priorities, changing their priorities, um, or reacting to, to, um, to what's happening in, in popular media or reacting to an NGO campaign. Mm -hmm. um, so that, you know, what I would say is, is companies who have made big commitments, big goals, that are trying to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions, let's say, and their agricultural footprint by a certain date. You know, they stick with those, you know, they continue on with those, um, with those goals. Um, but it's these other things that you mentioned, Chuck, that just sort of come up um, that can really be overwhelming and derail, you know, some of the good efforts that, that are underway already. Um, the other thing I hear that we've heard from growers is that, um, you know, I, I may provide data, you know, Andrew, to your point, it's like, you have my data, don't ask me for it again, but, you know, do you get any feedback back? Do you, are you getting feedback? You know, you're, you're putting it out there, you're reporting, you're asking, you're filling out the Excel sheet or whatever it is, but do you get information back? You know, how am I performing in sustainability? Like, how are you, you know, how is a company making value judgments based on this information? And that's where a lot of these, these platforms that already exist to, to help communicate that in both directions are really, really valuable. Um, and we need to help them scale because I think that getting that value to the grower is so important. Um, and on the connectivity piece, it's more on the communication side of things and, and priorities, but on the connectivity piece and standards, you know, there's, there's a couple of, of, of organizations that have made incredible headway. So Ag Gateway, um, yes. Open Ag Data Alliance, that are, are really trying to create those data standards, at least so that that equipment can talk to, to, talk to each other um, and that so different softwares can talk to equipment. And so there's been some great, some great headway made there. I think there's still room for improvement, but, but those organizations have really helped to create some of those standards. Um, but you know, back to the map that I showed of just this landscape that's changing every day, new software companies coming in with, with new technologies, and it's great, and the innovation is great. It's very hard to track. And so, you know, knowing which softwares um, are connected um, to different platforms and what they report and the value that they provide to growers, um, you know, it's just a very changing landscape. And so mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of hard to stay ahead of. <laughs> Thanks, Christy. And um, it's great. Our conversation is, is quite cumulative, and I appreciate it. That last point you made links back to Andrew's initial point about the, the risk of standards uh, tamping down dynamism, innovation, adaptability, flexibility. This comment you just made about new faces, new actors. We had a question in the Q&A about startups. Chuck, you represent a very established uh, and important company. Christy, many of your members are big brands we would all recognize. Um, what can you say about the, the uh, ongoing and future implications of new entrants, particularly from tech companies? Is there gonna be a shakeup? Are we already seeing a shakeup around conservation policy and sustainability? 
and what's happening is when we see new entries into the space. Yes, yeah, so I can I can take a shot and then go from there. Um, we have uh, a process and a way we deal with the startup approach to us. When we get we get approached on a very very regular basis and frequent basis about innovation uh, in technology or uh, software platforms or data collection, and we named it Ag Validity. And so it's a at least a three year process in which there's a screening process that goes on uh, with professionals in our agronomy business unit. Then we'll go out if it passes the first few hurdles of uh, you know, potential implementation, implementation and practical uh, implementation. We can then go out and pilot program with producers and then work through a feedback system. And then if it's su successful in the end, could be part of the implementation process. So at least we've got a system and a structure to deal with, with innovation. And I, I think that's, that's going to be critical. I, I personally think it's a, a very exciting time uh, for this. And we can see something like the, uh, the carbon credit market. There is a firm, and maybe more than one I should say, but there is a firm that's really uh, taking a foothold that I think in carbon credit uh, it's been tried before. It's obviously been on the Chicago Board of Trade and delisted, but uh, this company and its approach may be something that we see integrate into policy because you can feel the policy winds are blowing on climate change and carbon capture, uh, but it's going to be extremely important that uh, it allows and recognizes into unique production systems in each region of the country, as we've stated, and then also reward the farmer for uh, participating. Thanks, Chuck. If you're willing to put that um, link to this uh, innovative carbon credit initiative into the forum page, I'd be interested in the specifics. I can. And with respect to this idea of ag validity and having a vetting process and a feedback process, I think my kids are doing that with my cooking over the COVID uh, <laughs> home break. We have, we have a whole debrief after new recipes are introduced. So I like this adaptive cycle you, you described. Christy, do you want to say something about the implications of startups and a shakeup in the policy community? Absolutely. So I think I think we're seeing more innovation now than ever in the ag space, and I think it's wonderful. And so what I I see the incredible value of startups as they're just pushing, pushing, pushing the envelope, continuing to improve the precision and, and continuing to improve the ease of use um, for technology, and we need that. And so those are the companies that are really driving. Um, you know, I think the big companies also are driving change, but those, those new innovative nimble startups are the ones that are really gonna drive innovation in the ag space and allow for that flexibility, allow for that regional, regionalization. Um, you know, what we found over the course of, of the, the research we were doing, which was a two year project, you know, to create that final map of, of all the companies is that, you know, you know the new companies they get acquired, um, they scale, they, you know, they, that, that space is so fluid. Um, but, but at the heart of that is just a lot of incredible energy and a lot of incredible um, progress. And so, um, yeah, I, I, I see a lot of value um, with startups. And so um, the fact that there's a lot going on in this space, it's not, it's not a negative. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it's a lot to navigate. It's a lot to keep up with, but um, that's because progress is being made. Okay. Andrew, if you'd like to speak to that question, I mean, you're, I think it's an interesting idea between the uh, implications. If we were to have robust industry-wide standards, what would that do for new entries, competition, and would it be a significant barrier to entry? So if we all agree that um, new ideas, new technology, and low barriers of entry is important for the dynamism of US agriculture and solving tough sustainability problems. And we agree a need for standards. It's gonna be really important that we have some clarity about the interaction between standards and competition. Yeah, well, standards and competition and new ideas. So, you know, if something new comes out, the, the standards need to be able to be flexible enough to integrate that into, you know, what, what we're using. Um, you know, uh, Chuck was talking about how we need to allow 
the farmers to be flexible. And also some of these things are very expensive for us to implement. You know, I really, really want to do uh, no-till on my winter wheat this next year. I'm trying to figure out ways to pay for the $350,000 drill that that will require. Um, and boy, I wish I could have a 200 horsepower tractor because mine are five to 600 for, for my hills. <laughs> yes, but, uh, but, you know, it, that's, that's one of the really hard parts. It's, it's, you know, a lot of farmers, you know, man, I would love to do that, but you know, who's going to help me pay for that, you know, you know, half a million dollar investment, um, especially when the returns on farms right now are, are kind of at record lows. Um, you know, I, I keep trying to introduce things in ways where I get a less than one year ROI, and then I can hopefully get enough savings where I can help fund some of these other ideas. But, uh, you know, it's still not fast. I, you know, it still takes a while to recoup some of those investments. Thank you. And um, again, that, that really flows right into the next question. Um, and uh, if uh, any of you have taken uh, Environmental Economics 101, you'll recognize that the environment is, tends to be a focus of underinvestment. And lots of the sustainability benefits we can imagine on farms won't accrue to the farmer. And the farmer's uh, economic calculus and microeconomic calculation won't justify the investments, just as Andrew just outlined. But there are lots of benefits to conservation that accrue to society, off-farm, mm -hmm. sometimes very far away from the site of production. And that's the traditional justification for public policy. So on the one hand, Shari has emphasized in the, in the question and answer in the chat bar, the importance of talking about how can we uh, realize the power of consumers' value for sustainability criteria and pump those incentives, that information, and that money down to production to help the investments Andrew just talked about. But economic theory and our practical experience suggest that won't be sufficient, and there's a role for public policy. On the other hand, uh, while Chuck has eloquently and consistently advocated voluntarism and cooperative approach, um, what is the role of regulation and when should the polluter pay? And how does the polluter pays principle fit with this idea of generating economic incentives to drive farmers and pull, and that's Christie's word, pull farmers into a more sustainable mode of production, recognizing the uh, cost considerations that Andrew and Chuck have highlighted. It's a tough nut. Who wants to bite? <laughs> I can go first. <laughs> um, yeah, that, I mean, I think what you just described, Stephen, is at the heart of, of why we can't scale conservation. And so what I hear from brands and retailers over and over is we're not going to pay more. Um, and in certain cases, um, you know, only in certain certain cases like organic, um, only in certain cases where maybe there's a special program with, this, with a very specific goal, willing to pay a little bit more. And so this sort of, you know, price per bushel is not, not a, kind of a non-starter. And so um, we know that there's not going to be significant changes to the farm bill that's going to help, going to help support some of these conservation activities. So there needs to be something else. Um, I know carbon markets are starting, you know, nutrient markets are starting up here, getting established mm -hmm. in the United States. That's one avenue. I still don't think that that's going to solve um, this bigger issue of scale. It's definitely going to help if we can get those markets stood up. Um, but, but looking for more creative private sector, private public partnership types of solutions to get funding to farmers to get, get over that initial her financial hurdle, which is what Andrew just described, $350,000, that's, that's a non-starter. So how do we, how do we get, oh, whether it's philanthropic dollars matched with federal dollars matched with, um, with other dollars um, to get that money flowing and really get, um, there's a gap here. There's a clear gap here. It's a financial gap. Um, you know, there's, there's a role for the financial sector here. Um, there's a role for the insurance sector here. And there's a role for the private sector. Um, so I think we just need to, to create some new solutions um, if we want this to scale. 
Very good. And I think uh, that idea of layering and combining in new combinations and bringing in new resources and combining them in novel ways is an important way forward. And hopefully through dialogue, we can get more specific, but I appreciate that. Chuck, please. A quick bite on that too is uh, uh, the, the, what we know about the nitrogen and phosphorus cycle for all the work that our great land, land grant institutions continue to do and others in this field. Uh, when I talk to the scientists in programs that are looking at phosphorus movement, nitrogen movement, which tends to be the two focal points of water quality, when you say the word pollution, that sends shivers down the spines, I think, of most production agriculturalists, because the challenge is just because we apply fertilizer doesn't mean that it uh, turns into something that's a water quality challenge. Are there water quality challenges? Absolutely absolutely are. We've got to do whatever we can to address those. What we also find though is, is what role does stream bank erosion play? What, how long does it take for phosphorus to move through a watershed and from what sources is it coming from? What are natural and background uh, levels that are being there? And I know that I've been in policy conversations and the statements I'm making are an instant irritant. I know that. I know that is a case when it comes to um, policy discussions, but yet whenever I'm in the agronomy side or the soil science side, those are the conversations that we continue to have. So we've got to learn to be able to talk to one another past the points of what I would consider a common irritants, but there has to be some discussion to me of the science behind uh, watershed, natural systems, and then how we also can have uh, one of the most productive and efficient food production supply chains uh, in on the earth and yet also be as environmentally conscious and sustainable as possible and that is a that's a tough nut to crack but I think everybody on uh, is willing to discuss it and I think another thing we need to remember is that we need a if everyone up levels a little bit that's better than one percent going all the way and no one else doing anything so I think that we need to make sure that when we're thinking about these programs and when people are talking together that every little bit is better. You know, my some of my neighbors who farm like it's 1950, if they start farming like, right. you know, it's 1990s, that's still better, <laughs> you know, and we, re, we need to get everyone moving on the spectrum. There is a wide spectrum. And, and I think that's important to remember that to realize the best gains, we need to have everyone moving up the spectrum. It doesn't have to be at the top. And a lot of older programs used to be you have to be at the top of the spectrum. Well, you know, wouldn't it be better if we just get everyone to move forward? Because um, it is a big change to people's livelihoods and, and traditions that they've done for a long time. And you have to kind of respect that and allow for the time for it to change. Thanks, Andrew. And I think it's interesting to reflect that if we take your advice to heart, and I think it is important advice because in theory, that's the low hanging fruit as well are those folks who are not on the bleeding edge. Um, and that's where a lot of value can be created through moderate investment. And to add value to your operation, that's gonna require a, a serious uh, team of researchers and, and equipment and so forth. But in that middle part of the distribution, perhaps there's a lot of progress to be made at relatively low cost. But again, when we talk, Christy and others have talked and Andrew talked about uh, very practical and basic problems like uh, broadband infrastructure and uh, so it's not so easy to simply say, let's tap into that middle section and, and raise the bar there. But it is a very important idea. Let me thank uh, Andrew, Christy, and Chuck for their presentations, all of you for your questions. The dialogue's not finished. Uh, please continue to send questions and contribute to the forum page. And with that, let me turn it back to Sherry for conclusion for today's session. Thank you. Great. Yes. Thank you, Stephen. And, and thank you to all of our wonderful speakers for your perspectives and your insights. Um, in our last session, we held a, an after hours coffee session. And I certainly feel I was an active chatter in the chat <laughs> function this uh, session. And, and I look forward to continuing the dialogue in other ways um, after today's session concludes. But thank you to all of you and to our active uh, participants online, too, for all of your questions.
So just as a reminder, uh, for those of you who have signed up for session four, it will take place on June 3rd. And this session is intended to be a working and collaborative opportunity specifically geared to researchers and policy experts with a chance to network and plan opportunities to, for further action and research together. So thank you again for joining us throughout this entire series, and we hope that you found it valuable and we look forward to continuing the dialogue in other ways as we move forward. So with that, I would conclude our session today and uh, look forward to continuing the dialogue in other ways. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>